Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's History Revealed, the Conamara Irish Despair in the Heartland with Jane Kennedy. Thank you to our partner, Roseville Library, part of the Ramsey County Library System. The Ramsey County Historical Society and Roseville Library have been partners in presenting this History Revealed series of programs for over three years now. Although we can't present programs in person, we're pleased to be able to present tonight's program and we'll have more History Revealed programs coming up. The mission of RCHS is to preserve our past, inform our present, and inspire our future through publishing a quarterly magazine, award-winning books, and presenting programs such as these History Revealed series. We also provide education about Dakota lifeways and the traditions of the early settlers to school children and families through the Gibbs Farm Historic Site. RCHS is committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community and is actively engaged in issues of equity and inclusion. RCHS will be partnering with Roseville Library and others to present programs in conjunction with an upcoming exhibition on women's suffrage in Minnesota called Persistence, Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality, 1848 to 2020. Please watch for more information on this exhibition, exhibition, which will be premiered online in October, and watch for more programs on the RCHS website, www.rchs.com. And please consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society. Since tonight's program has been pre-taped in front of a small audience, we won't be able to answer additional questions live this evening. However, if you have questions for tonight's presenter, please type them in the chat comments areas on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll post the answers later. So let me introduce our speaker tonight. Jane Kennedy lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. Her interest in exploring Irish famines is linked to her family's immigration in the 1880s from County Mayo, Ireland. Jane has a BA in English and Journalism from St. Catherine University and an MA in Business Communications from the University of St. Thomas. Jane was able to obtain dual U.S. and Irish citizenship in 2016 following two visits to her grandfather's homeland in County Mayo in Ireland. So, Jane Kennedy. Well, thank you very much, Robin. I'm very happy to be able to present tonight on this interesting group of people from Ireland who came to Minnesota, namely the Connemaras. The name of the presentation, as you can see, is Despair in the Heartland. So I'd like to give you an overview of my presentation tonight. First of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the famine conditions in Connemara and then the journey that the Connemaras took to their new homeland in Minnesota. I'll talk about what happened when they were living in western Minnesota in a town called Graceville, and then how they ended up leaving that, that is plan B in the future. And I'll wrap up my presentation with, uh, I'll take a few questions at the end. So, I'd like to share uh, this slide with you. Uh, this quote in particular is ent entitled, um, or the quote is, immigration is an individual experience and each participant has a different story to tell. And this quote comes from a professor, a retired professor from Galway, Gerard Moran, who taught at the University of Galway. And his words, um, are you can find in his book fleeing from famine and i really like to take to heart what his quote is here because i do believe each individual has a unique experience and we come from a, a country where many of our families are actually uh, are actually immigrated here so um with that i hope that you will treasure that that quote there as we proceed to this presentation I want to begin by showing you a map of the Connemara region. And this is 
the area that the immigrants left from in 1880, this is where the famine occurred. And um, the famine, um, the, this particular famine that I'm referring to at this time was actually taking place in the late 1870s. And it includes this area here, uh, if you can see with my pointer here. It's a little northwest of Galway, but some of the towns that were particularly impacted by this particular famine were um, Letterfrack, Clifton, Karna, Utterard, Kong. And so this area in particular, but that's not to say that other areas along Western Ireland were not also impacted as well, in particular May, the county, county Mayo as well. Um, and I would just point out, uh, personal pride here is that my family came from the Belmollet Peninsula, which is right here. They too left Ireland in uh, 1883 as a result of famine to come here. Now, as you can tell, Connemara is situated on the most Western seaboard. It's actually the most Western seaboard, uh, seaboard of Europe. Its topography includes rocky terrain, extensive bogs and a rugged coastline. Patrick Greeley was a county Catholic administrator from Karna, which I pointed out to you here. And he described the region as the remotest and poorest promontory in Connemara, hemmed in one side by lofty mountains and extensive bogs, and on the other by the fierce Atlantic. He remarked that the barren land was, quote, never intended by God or nature for the habitation of man. So what were some of the causes of the famine in 1879? Well, no doubt the topography of the Connemara region contributed to the adverse conditions, but among the other factors were um, population explosion. Now, and this occurred specifically in the Connemara region in the three decades following the Great Famine. Now, remember the Great Famine took place between 1845 and 1852. But for some reason, there was a population explosion in this particular area of Ireland, the Western part, and it was unique to that part of Ireland. The rest of the, of the island did not have the sim a similar population explosion. Um, there was there were heavy storms and heavy rains um, in the fall of 1879 that led to spoiled a spoiled potato harvest before potatoes could even be gathered in. That summer of 1879, it rained two out of every three days, and two years later, the value of the potato harvest was only a third of that of the 1876 crop. Now, kelp also attracted people to settle on the islands and the, rugged, and the nearby coastline of Western Ireland. Kelp was used as a fertilizer and was a huge financial boon. However, Peruvian potash from South America was discovered and that reduced the demand and the cost of kelp. Finally, three years of bad weather resulted in fishermen not being able to go out and catch fish, which also eliminated, eliminated a major supply of food. Now, I wanna show you what was happening with the people that were living in Western Ireland in County Galway, the Connemara region. Um, there were many evictions going on by landlords who wanted money for their rent and were not getting it. What ended up was, that some of the people ended up living in what's called an Irish scalpine. What it is, it's simply a hole. It's often built within the walls when any are left standing of a home, of unripped houses, and it's above the surface and built out of old materials. So as you can see in this picture, this is actually a man's home. There is no longer any roof. The people, the landlords would come and destroy the homes. In some cases, there were, the evictions resulted in families totally being taken out of their home. And then the walls 
um, were filled in with the with brick material if there were any walls left standing. Um, people, um, many people were way behind on their rent payments and the landlords didn't care. They just threw the people out and threw them out into the streets, families and all. And here's an example of what um, one surface looked like. Um, again, filled with the entrances filled with bricks. Now the causes of the fan resulted in people being unable to pay their landlords, which resulted in pauperism increasing, bank deposits decreased, exports had shrunk, and there was bankrupt bankruptcy among farmers. Um, landlords in one parish had raised rents by as much as 150% in a six to seven year time span. Starvation and famine fever uh, were rampant. So between starvation and death, there is a disease referred to as famine fever. And this was very um, common as the, uh, as the famine continued throughout Western Ireland. And Patrick Greeley writes, a famine fever has broken out here extensively and has already whole families within its death grip who have neither bed nor bed clothes sufficient to preserve life in even the most robust constitution. He wrote this in a letter to Thomas Flaherty of Minneapolis when he was trying to find help for these people, trying to see if somehow they, he could get these people to come to the United States. Specifically, it, it didn't matter where, he was trying to find a home for these people. And the Midwest was an attractive area because there were Irish people settled in St. Paul and Minneapolis already as well as in Boston and Chicago and other parts of the country. Now, one of the people who was very key in helping bring Irish, um, Irish people who were faced with starvation, who were victims of the famines, was a man named James Hacktooth. Uh, as you can see on the slide, he was an English philanthropist and Quaker, and he really did a lot to assist the poor. His efforts started with famine relief in 1847, so right before the Great Famine. And he continued to care about the people of Ireland after the Great Famine and including the famine of the late 1870s. Now, Mr. Toop visited the west of Ireland in the spring of 1880 after hearing there was much distress. He was aghast at the extreme poverty that he saw but he did more than just contribute money to those in need. He set up a fund, the Took Fund, which helped many people emigrate with dignity. In many cases, Mr. Took personally screened and selected the immigrants to come over. He took them to their ports. He arranged for the ships to take them across the Atlantic and he gave them money for new clothing and, um, and money for when they came to the United States he also made sure there was somebody here in the United States to be there when they arrived and help these people find employment. I revere Mr. James Hack too, because I truly believe he is the person who saved my own family from dire consequences. When Took came in April of 1888, he observed a number of things. Now he was traveling with a local government inspector and this is what he said. I wish I could produce that rocky coast and wild miserable village or rather introduce it into England for a while so that English people might realize how in these remote places so many thousands of people are living. Now keep in mind that Mr. Took is an Englishman himself. When he returned to the western part of Ireland in April 1880, he came on a fact-finding mission, and there he discovered some very distressing conditions. He later revealed that it was this visit to Western Ireland that truly changed his life and became the impetus for his work to assist the country's impoverished citizens. What he saw when he came in April of 1880 was were people who were poorly clad, 
living with cattle in their homes. There had been no distribution of food the previous week. People were eating small old potatoes and that was their, that was their diet. And he saw three children under one covering ill with fever in one home. Um, I want to point out this photo, which again, um, this is this is entitled All That Is Left of this poor woman sitting on top of a table outside of her home. This is a scene from a county Mayo eviction, so a little bit north of County, county Galway, but a newspaper in Cincinnati, Ohio, described the entire population of Karna, and I pointed that city out earlier, that town out earlier on the map, almost 5,000 at the time, um, as being on the high road to death by starvation. Hunger had overtaken nearly a third of them already. Mothers were seen walking barefoot over rough ground in search of Indian meal for their corn. And notice here that a lot of times you will see in almost every picture that the women and the children are, are without shoes. And this is this woman's belongings. All that is left, how aptly named. This is a photo also from the Mayo County Library of a Galway eviction process. Oftentimes these were very violent undertakings where the soldiers or English people stormed and stormed the residents and forced them out. In the, um, okay, so then this next picture is a fisherman's cabin. So take a look at the austerity. Here you see what looks to be like a, a dog or a cow, a little baby here, very distressing situation. Um, in the town of Otterard, a correspondent for a Dublin newspaper described how sometimes up to nine family members shared a single straw bed. Now, to help these people, several relief committees were formed in Ireland. There was the Mansion House Relief Committee and the Duchess of Marlborough Relief Committee. These were two of the larger relief committees. And these committees provided relief to hundreds of thousands of people. And were it not for these relief committees and others, more people would have succumbed to starvation. Now, as much as I revere James Hack Tooth, who you saw earlier, it was actually Father James Nugent of Liverpool, England, who basically got the ball rolling to get people to come to the United States. Um, he wrote a letter to Bishop Ireland, among other bishops in the United States, to ask them for assistance. Father Nugent indicated that he would try to find the money to pay for transportation costs if only these people could settle. Father Nugent wrote, I consider that if I could only help 100 families to immigrate from Connemara this spring, it would be an immense blessing to those who leave the country and would give greater opportunities to those who remain. Now, initially, Bishop Ireland was very skeptical, skeptical of having the Irish people come uh, to emigrate here. Um, but once he got the letter, he said he would try to raise money. And in no time, he was able to raise $5,000. Now, what he did was he sent out letters to parishes in St. Paul and surrounding areas. And of course, the people in our community were very generous. There were many Irish people who were here already, people who were settled, people who were doing well. In addition, Bishop Ireland persuaded railroad officials to transport the immigrants from Boston to Western Minnesota at no cost. Now, while many saw the bishop's effort at bringing the Connemars to Minnesota as a benevolent act, others saw it as Bishop Ireland's grand plan of colonization. So there was a debate going on in Ireland. Um, some people argued they didn't want the Irish people to leave, even though people were dying, many people were dying and shopkeepers and some clergy were opposed to immigration. And why is that? Well, the shopkeepers, even though they had exhausted cr giving credit to the people, knew that the more people left, that eventually if things would turn around, 
um, fewer people, I meant fewer shoppers for them, fewer people buying. And same with the clergy, they saw their parish ranks thinning if people were to leave. And yet the people of Western Ireland told Took it was only the cost that kept them from leaving. And there is an example of a young strong man who had built a house of superior class. It had windows, plastered walls, a timbered roof. Now imagine that back in those days, 1880, he was evicted from his home. He told Mr. Took that he was sure he could earn a living in America. And he asked Mr. Took to send for help um, to get him and his family to uh, emigrate to the United States. So what was it that Bishop Ireland promised the immigrants? I mean, what, were they, what, what were they going to come to? So he said that he was going to put together 50 farm sites in Western Minnesota, each on 160 acres. They would have a small frame house, modestly furnished, and also a cow. And five acres of soil were to be broken for planting. Now, on the surface, this looks like an enticing offer. But I want to, I just want to point out at this, this point here in my presentation, that third bullet there, the five acres of soil. So if people were given 160 acres, it took approximately a year for people to break the soil. And what I mean by breaking soil is the soil was so hard um, from the sun and from the elements that it took, if you could break, it's, it was said that if you could break uh, 15 acres in a year, you were doing exceedingly well. So just imagine if you could only break 15 acres for planting, how long would it take you to break 160 acres? Well, a matter of years. So I want you to keep that in mind as we proceed through this presentation and as the immigrants come to Minnesota. So here's the timetable. On June 11th, the immigrants were to be leaving Ireland. They left their homes the night before, accompanied by their parish priest. And again, there, is, there were different um, locations here. I mean, they were around the area that I pointed out earlier, but so there were several different parish priests that were assisting. In total, there were 37 families and 70 unmarried men and women. On the morning of June 11th, there was a mass at 6 a.m. at the Cathedral of St. Nicholas. Now, most immigrants arrived at the port in a state of poverty. Father Nugent was there and he provided clothing for people. After mass, people were asked to get on board. The, they, they had um, tugboats that would take them out in small groups to the large, um, uh, the large ship. It was called the SS Austrian. And once the immigrants were on the large ship, uh, Father Dooley addressed the travelers from the shore. Um, and he said, his parting words were, um, leaving is akin to death because even though the rocks and hills of Connemara were sterile, every spot was dear to them. And more important than country and language was the faith of their fathers. Finally, he told the immigrants, you might never again be addressed by a priest in your own language. And this must have been hard to hear for those people. This slide is just um, a picture of the list of passengers. And there were about eight sheets like this list. And if you can see in the upper right-hand corner here, there's th this list here is a group of stowaways. And this page starts out with Glasgow passengers, but the Irish passengers are continued on the other pages. So this is the timetable then of the journey to their new homeland. They left, as I said, on June 11th um, from the port of Galway. They arrived in Boston on June 22nd, so 11 days traveling. Now, when they arrived, they arrived in the afternoon, and yet they were told they could not leave the ship until the morning. So they had to spend yet another day on this large ship. They left Boston, and they made a stop in Chicago. Uh, 
and when they arrived in Chicago, um, they they were looking uh, not well at all. But uh, briefly, they took um, from Boston. Once they reached Boston, they took uh, the Western Express train to St. Paul, which they reached on June 26th. And then they took wagons from the town of Morris, Minnesota to Graceville. Now that's a 28 mile trip just from, the, the, from Morris to Graceville. It was said that people were gaunt, had been starving and were in very weakened conditions when they arrived. The voyage, Father Nugent engaged Thomas Campbell of London to accompany the immigrants to their new home. And obviously this is what they ran into some of the time. It's reported that the ship passed large icebergs and at times there were violent waves, but the journey also included calm seas that coaxed the travelers to dance to the tunes from an Irish flute. William Onahan was a friend of, the Arch of Archbishop Ireland who lived in Chicago. And when the train pulled up in Chicago at the station, this is what he said. The famine was visible in their pinched and emaciated faces and in the shriveled limbs. They could scarcely be called legs and arms of the children. Their features were quaint and the entire company was squalid and wretched. And as I mentioned earlier, few women and none of the children wore shoes. Now at the stop when they made, after they left Chicago then and came to Minnesota, and they, they came to St. Paul, as I mentioned, there were about 70 unmarried young people who detrained in St. Paul, where jobs were already waiting for them. The men were to work mainly on the railroads and the young women were to be employed as domestic help and seamstresses for the wealthy families of St. Paul. In addition to supporting themselves, the young people were expected to send part of their wages to their families in Graceville. So here is a map of Minnesota and specifically I want to point out so here's where the Connemars arrived in St. Paul. They took a, a train or yes they took a, the Western Express train all the way to Morris and then they took uh, wagons from Morris to Graceville which is located 20 miles to the west in Big Stone County. By the time the gaunt and poverty-stricken immigrants reached Graceville, they had traveled some 3,721 miles, journeying by tugboat, steamship, train, and wagon, only to arrive in a homeland that looked nothing like the place they had just left. Now, it was described by a journalist, Joe Cook, who came to Graceville in 1990, again, 1990, who was doing work on a documentary and also was writing an article about the Connemaras. Now, Joe Quick was a Galway journalist. And from his research, he said it was an ill fit from the get-go. He said they were not farmers, the ones sent to Graceville. They were odd jobbers, kelp gatherers, fishermen, masons. They were very poor people who did whatever they could find. Now, Joe Cook came to Graceville to interview whatever, whoever he could find who were still from the lineage of the Connemaras. Um, as you can see from his quote, the Connemaras trip to Minnesota was a recipe for disaster even before they departed from their wagons at Graceville. So let's talk briefly about Bishop Ireland, who had a major influence on in bringing the Connemaras here. Was he a friend or a foe? Well, it appeared that Bishop Ireland really did have a grand plan of colonization. Um, he met with Mr. Took um, to ensure a, tr a smooth transition for the Connemaras. And Took actually came to the United States, um, including St. Paul, about seven times before the Connemars made their journey here. So Mr. Took was also doing due diligence in trying to see if this could, could work. Um, but again, Archbishop from my readings sure 
seem to think that are sure seem to point to the fact that the bishop wanted to see more Catholics spread out in the rural parts of Minnesota, which of course was already filling up with many Lutherans at the time. And so he was very much um, pro-colonization of Catholic, pro-Catholic colonization. Um, now Bishop Ireland was a great friend of James J. Hill, specifically um, Mr. Hill's wife, who was a Catholic. Now the railroad contracted out land to Bishop Ireland, yet the U.S. Department of the Interior still owned the land. Thousands of acres were available to sell, and Bishop Ireland was a contractor, excuse me, that should say contractor, and he received a 10% commission on everything that he sold. Ah, he had two years to sell the land in Graceville, otherwise the railroad would repossess the land. It wasn't long after the Connemars arrived, maybe within a month or two, that discontent started to grow. The Connemars claimed they had little to eat and not enough clothing. The men who had come from Ireland were more interested in taking jobs as day laborers not farmers of lands much larger than what they were accustomed to. Um, so Bishop Ireland visited the Connemaras in September amid talk of their suffering and hardship. When he, then the bishop came, the Connemaras expressed their desire to return to St. Paul. They wanted to be reunited with the children that were dropped off there. And they felt like they could do work that was more applicable to their backgrounds and their skills. Um, more citizens began to get wind of what was taking place in Graceville, and they began to accuse Bishop Ireland of neglect. Um, meanwhile, the, some of the Graceville residents accused the uh, new arrivals of being lazy and relying solely on handouts from the bishop and clergy. A particular nemesis of the Connemaras was the local priest, Father Timothy Ryan. While in Graceville, Bishop Ireland learned that some immigrants favored day labor work over farming and were complaining about treatment by their employers and the low wages they were earning. So what did the bishop do? He was enraged when he heard this. And so he instituted a system of public works financed by the dioceses and that would pay the workers half of what they had been earning. So they had been making $2 a day and now they were only gonna be making $1. And the bishops threatened that anyone who complained would have his credit for provisions cut off. Um, visitors to Graceville defended the new settlers. And again, many of these Graceville, or many of these visitors were people from the surrounding Morris uh, area. And this is what was written in the Morris Tribune. It does not seem possible that large numbers of poor families were brought here late in the season and left to starve and freeze to death on the prairies. Their condition is deplorable. And if what we hear is true, a terrible blunder or worse, has been made. Well, accusations begin to fly. By late fall, residents of nearby Morris continue to accuse the bishop of neglecting his people. They contact the St. Paul newspaper to report on the fate of the Connemara people in Graceville. Well, of course, who's reading the newspapers but the bishop and many of the Irish people in St. Paul and surrounding areas who contributed to bringing the Irish people here. As if things aren't bad enough, the settlers or the immigrants face what has become known as the hard winter of 1880 to 81. Amidst all the turmoil, winter set in early and was severe. The first blizzard occurred on October 15th and ran through th for three days. Now, anyone who is familiar with Minnesota knows that we do get blizzards here but it's pretty rare when there's a blizzard that arrives in the middle of October. The winter turned out to be one of the worst since European descended settlers arrived in the region and began documenting weather. 
it was difficult across the plains and the Midwest and it impacted transportation, fuel availability, food supplies, human and livestock health. Now I'd like to share this picture. This is a picture actually that was taken in Winona. But as you can see, it shows how high the snowbanks were from this particular winter. Look where the snow comes, where look where the snow banks are in terms of the height of a man here and the height of the railroad. How can these people even throw that snow that high? This shot um, gives you an example of the severity of the weather. Um, wintry weather returned again by mid-November. There were blizzards in December, and then when people turned the calendar to the next year, um, 1881, there was a blizzard that began on Christmas Day. In 1881, from January through February, there were only 12 days with no reportable snow. Now, the severe weather of 1880-81 was a subject of Dr. Barbara Boosted's PhD dissertation. In, and in it, she confirmed that the winter showed in literature from that time period was accurate and is considered among, again, the top five in severity in Minnesota. And of course, as we all know who live here, that's not a ranking to be taken lightly. Dr. Boosted claims in her dissertation that there were few deaths from the severe winter and that was mainly due to the fact that people stayed inside their tiny homes and waited out winter. Now, I just want to show you this picture. Um, again, this is a, a modern day photo. This is taken um, from winter of 2019. But as you can see, the wind is blowing across the prairies. And even though it's a contemporary photo, think back of what it would have looked, back, looked like back all those years in 1880. And the winter of 1880-81 was documented in literature, including the book by Laura Ingalls Wilder entitled The Long Winter, which was published in 1940. Dr. Boosted claims in her dissertation that um, Laura Ingalls Wilder's account of that long winter and um, long hard winter was quite accurate. Um, I wanted to show you this picture too. Um, some sound. Now again, this is a contemporary photo, but you can see how brutal this winter looks um, on this country road. Now, as I mentioned before, there had been complaints from more the people in Morris were saying that there were there were issues here people were not were fed, were not uh, were still hungry they didn't have clothing and while the winter brought its own problems the discontent raged on the Morris uh, Tribune continued to report on conditions in Graceville and and so at this point um, three reports ultimately are written about what's happening um, first of all there's a report written by Henry Hutchins, who was appointed by the Morris Board of Trade to write a report. The, excuse me, yeah, okay, so the Hutchins report ends up being telegraphed to Minnesota Governor John Pillsbury and Bishop Ireland. The findings of his report make it into the newspapers in Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, and Boston. And guess what? The headlines are scathing. So Bishop Ireland is again very upset. So he dispatches his friend Dylan O'Brien and Leonard Hodges to visit Graceville so they can write their own report. Now what happens is quite um, not, not intended, but O'Brien and Hodges end up writing their own separate reports and each report was very different, was dramatically different from the other. Leonard Hodges writes, I have seen with my own eyes a condition of squalid poverty and human suffering rarely found in any civilized community. Disgraceful alike to the state, to the colonization bureau, and the resident priest. The disparate 
reports produce even more outrage and Bishop Ireland can no longer hold back. So on December 23rd, 1880, um, notice two days right before Christmas, he writes a letter to the Pioneer Press and in it he says, the Connemars are paupers of long standing, totally demoralized and unmanned by years of suffering and unaccustomed to providing for their own wants. In fact, he totally disparages the Connemars. He writes, immigrants are not the class we had bargained, these immigrants are not the class we had bargained for. Sadly, the Connemars couldn't even read the bishop's letter in this edition of the Pioneer Press that condemned them for being, uh, for just being there and for being who and what they were, namely survivors of two Irish famines in 30 years, victims of eviction from their homes by rent hungry landlords, and then victims of the worst storm in Minnesota history. Bishop Ireland's advice in his newspaper article, forget the Connemara's. So after the Connemara's lived in Graceville for over eight months, Archbishop Ireland finally relents and provides funding for them to return to St. Paul. He refers to his experience in dealing with the Connemara's as the greatest grief of my life. Yet months later, he would try his hand at colonization again by sending a group of Irish immigrants to Curry, Minnesota. That wasn't a success story either. So the Connemaras leave Graceville and they, they, they come to settle in St. Paul in what is known as a Connemara patch. Now this area has also been home to many different ethnic groups before and after the Connemara's arrival. And it is a settlement that's just less than a mile from the eastern part of the downtown area. From a geographical standpoint, the area was quite the opposite of the plains of western Minnesota. So Connemara Patch was located at the foot of an enormous bluff. The area was haphazardly laid out with irregular roads, railroad tracks that were spread throughout the area, and a collection of tiny huts with just a few feet of space between them. It turns out that the Connemara Patch was a dumping ground from the people who were living above, and the people who lived above them were quite wealthy. Um, people and industries that occupy the upper houses used the patch as a makeshift dump. The people below, the Connemaras at the time, scavenged for clothing, metals, building supplies, and even shoe pens. Now this is what I would call a glorified picture of the Connemara region. It's, a, it's actually an oil portrait, um, which I got from the Minnesota Historical Society. It's dated 1935, and again, I think it's a nice looking uh, portrait. However, you can see how close the houses are. There's water flood flooding running through here. And again, the, the, close, the closeness of the homes. But again, I do think that this makes this area look much nicer than it really turned out to be, especially when you hear these words. So life in the patch, a journalist um, happened to be walking in St. Paul, just outside of downtown, and he heard children talking, and he didn't know where they were coming from. And he finally peers over the bluffs, and he, and he sees these children way down below. And he says, and he writes in his article, if you are tender hearted, well, you better keep away from the tiny settlement. Now this article was written in March 1902, some 20 years after the Connemara's relocated to the patch. He sees children playing outside and writes every garment was in tattered, tatters. There were tragedies. Sometimes the bluff, the rocky bluff would give way and there were times when actual houses would just crumble. There were train accidents where people would walk out their homes and a train would come by and, and hit them, and kill them. And then he wrote about two sisters who lived in the patch, one of whom made Irish point lace. They had no schooling. They supported themselves by washing and scrubbing, and they didn't realize the value of their Irish handiwork. Here's a picture of the Connemara patch today. 
notice still there is the so the bluffs notice the pooling of water i had taken this photo shortly after rainfall i think but the railroad tracks and then wait in the back here you could see the mississippi river and another picture and another picture and i'm very happy to say that this area now is turned into a really beautiful environmental area where people can walk and take in the solitude of the area. It is very pretty there now. So what is the legacy from Graceville? If you go back to the Holy Rosary Church and look through their records, you'll find a history book that they put together in 1997. And in it, they take Bishop Ireland's recommendation to the, to the Irish settlers who remained in Graceville by saying, Forget the Connemaras. The book's account characterizes the immigrants as not competent, not the industrious, but the shiftless. Ultimately, in Graceville, Connemaras were dismissed as failures, even to this very day. Bridget Connolly wrote a very uh, incredible book called Forgetting Ireland. And she said, um, Father, uh, Father Ireland's um, suppressed our history and a hidden identity. He made our people's place name an insult, an insulting epithet by shifting the shame of scandal to the group least able to defend its own good name in the blizzards of print that surrounded their every move. In wrapping up this presentation, I would like to just offer my thoughts. I think the Connemars were brave people who endured incredible hardship in Ireland as well as here. History continues to prove that they are one group of immigrants among many that still comes to America to seek a better life for themselves and their descendants. Now, I just wanna mention a book that was recently published just within the last month or so. And it talks about the Irish famines before and after the great hunger. And um, I am happy to say that I have a chapter in this book on the Connemaras with much more detail than I've been able to give uh, during this presentation. You can find the book online at Amazon or through, um, there's also available through an Irish bookstore, Kenny's IE. But again, if you get it from Ireland and you um, are a Prime member, you can get it for free shipping, with free shipping. And that is my presentation and I would love to entertain questions at this time. Thank you so much, Jane, for that wonderful presentation. We do have a few questions in the chat, and I'll read those. And then um, if you can answer those, that would be fantastic. The first question is, Galway and County Mayo were part of the Gaelic-speaking region of Ireland. Did these immigrants speak English? That's a very good question. And it's one I wondered because I had read that in order for the immigrants to be able to come here, one of, the, one of the tests or requirements was that somebody in the family coming over had to speak English. And I had, I had wondered myself, who in my family would have been able to speak English? But the children were taught, were taught English in schools as early as the 1840s. So I do believe that the children were able to speak, were able to speak English, yes. Great, thank you. Um, the second question is earlier Irish immigrants from the potato famine of 1848 arrived in so-called coffin ships because so many travelers died en route. Did all of the immigrants that ended up on the ship survive the journey or do you have an idea of how many people died along the way? That's a great question. I do not have the number of people who died along the way, but in my research on the Connemaras, and again, remember this is 1880, so it's not during the Great Famine, but the people who were instrumental in bringing the immigrants here, specifically um, Father Nugent and Mr. Took and Bishop Ireland, um, these people both in Ireland, but mainly the people in Ireland who were helping with this immigration, made sure that the people were traveling on a, a great, a good, um, uh, line of ships. And this was the Allen line, which produced um, 
I think, much better ships than what the immigrants in earlier years had been transported over in. So were they st still in steerage? I do not know that. It's possible, but I do think these were ships that were, that were built better. And, um, and I've read several accounts of that. So I, I don't think there were as many deaths. But having said that, I also know that in 1883, when my own family came here, I know that um, the youngest member of the family was two years old and she arrived alive in Boston, but there is no record of her after that. So I don't know if she took ill or what, but yeah, I don't know. Thank you. It's a it's very sad story of the ship voyages. Um, it's always hard for us to imagine that since we can just get on a plane and go over. Right. Um, the next question is, why do you call them the Connemaras? Was that their names or was it the region from which they emigrated? Um, that is the region for, from which they emigrated. That is considered the Connemara region. And I believe there are um, mountains in that area called the Connemaras. There's also an interesting book called Connemara, a little Celtic kingdom, which uh, talks more about that, that region, but it is called the Connemara region. And actually to be called a Connemara now, people that are called Connemaras is not looked at um, in a positive light just because of what happened to them when they were in Graceville and how they were treated and and what you know the names they were called by the Archbishop and, and others who just thought they were lazy. So it's a, it's considered a pejorative term. But in my presentation, I use it just because it's um, it's it's my way to refer to the to those people, and it's not in any way meant uh, meant to be demeaning. The next question is, whatever became of the Connemaras after they stayed in St. Paul? Um, it's very difficult to be able to trace what happened to the Connemaras after that. Um, it's, I've tried looking in um, city directories and there, it's, it's not possible to find mailboxes um, or, or mail addresses for the people that lived there, even though I know some of the street names of that region. However, um, I do know that in 1940, a Connemara um, man actually became mayor of St. Paul in 1940. There was much prejudice against all Irish immigrants in the 19th century. Was part of Bishop Ireland's cold reaction to the Connemara people based partly on his fear that their poverty and squalor would be seen as indicative of the condition of all Irish Americans, or was he possibly embarrassed by them? I think um, it's hard to say, you know, the, the Archbishop himself came from Ireland, but his, his people were of more money and, um, I, I, I really don't know, but I think he was probably embarrassed and I think he had hoped for a better outcome once these people came to Graceville. Okay, thank you, Jane. I think that's the end of our questions. Um, and again, thank you everybody for watching this evening. We so appreciate everybody who's, um, participating via Facebook or YouTube. And again, please watch our website at rchs.com for more presentations. Feel free to put any questions that you may have going forward in the comments and we'll try to get back to you. And again, thank you all for supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society.